we are a justice-making, truth-seeking people. We gather as a community of believers and seekers. We share a reverence for the mystery of life. We are building the beloved community. Come, let us worship together. As we light this chalice, may it serve to give us clarity of purpose and illumine our way as we set about doing the work of this congregation in commitment, in cooperation, and in love.
And we'll give them garlands instead of ashes. Oh, we'll build a land where peace is born. Come build a land where siblings and cousins, anointed by God, may then create peace where justice shall fall down like waters and peace like an Today's worship theme is ask not what your church can do for you. We're getting into the time of year where we talk a lot about the work and effort that it takes to create church. As we are getting into stewardship season and our pledge campaign, I'm going to ask you to think a little bit about church as a verb. This Sunday is dedicated specifically to our last exploration of the fifth principle of Unitarian Universalism is the right to conscience and the use of the democratic process in our congregations and society at large. UU churches use the democratic process in our decision making. We vote, we vote on things. A healthy democratic process requires the voters to be informed and committed and to participate. Look forward to exploring that with you today and then also in the month to come. It takes a village to raise a child. This is something many of us know. But what does that mean? Well, there may be a playmate, a teacher, a chef, a fixer, and a variety of others who play different roles at different times. All of them are important villagers helping guide and raise a child. It is a beautiful image. But it is a hypothetical village, which, when described in this way, places me, the listener, on the outside. I can comfortably sit here and say, cool, that's a really beautiful image, and leave it at that. Well, forget the village, says Reverend Greg Stewart in Sunday School is Dead, Long Live Sunday School. Become a villager to all the children in our church and community. This call is different. It is not a mere observation that it takes a village. It actually asks me to do something. Forget the village and begin to recognize myself as the playmate, teacher, chef, fixer, one of the people vital to the growth of a child. Recognize my responsibility to the community I belong to. So who are you? as a villager? And what is it that you are being asked to do next for your community? The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free 
and welcoming religious community that encourages the lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas, environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. Our recipient for February is Michigan Liberation, whose mission is to end the criminalization of black families and communities of color. They train and develop formerly incarcerated people and their loved ones to lead in advocating for transformation of the criminal legal system. One of their current projects is to grow support for legislative bills to reform our state's cash bail system. Contributions can be made to our website, Venmo, username at B-U-C-M-I, or a check in the mail. However you choose to give, please do so with a heart of gratitude and for each other. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude.
We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate our si ourselves to the service, to its service. We've come now to the time in our service that we set aside for prayer and centering and reflection. We begin with the sharing of joys and sorrows from our congregation. Today, many of us bring heavy hearts to this sacred time. Surely all of us are concerned about the people of Ukraine and we hold them in our hearts this morning. In fact, we hold everyone who is impacted by this war in our hearts. And we are mindful of the interdependent nature of life and what impacts one of us impacts all of us. This morning also, Jesse Beal has shared a sorrow for transgender children and youth and their families across this country. They tell us that trans youth have been the target of a coordinated attack of over 150 anti-LGBTQA plus bills in state houses across the country this past year alone. Recent examples include Texas redefining child abuse to include gender affirming medical care and Florida's don't say gay bill that prohibits the discussion of sexual orientation and gender identity in schools. Jesse finishes by saying, LGBTQA plus youth deserve to grow up and get to be LGBTQA plus adults. My heart is with these children and their families as they navigate hatred and hostility. And mine is as well. Finally, Dennis and Barbara Aylward share a deep sorrow with our congregation. Their son, Jonathan, died tragically in the past few days. Jonathan grew up in our church, and many of you will remember him. Dennis and Barbara request your thoughts and your prayers for themselves and for the rest of their family as they navigate this difficult time. And these beautiful flowers that are on our chancel today are from Jonathan's memorial service that was held yesterday. Holding these things in your heart and your mind, I invite you now to join me moving deeper into the spirit of prayer and meditation. Spirit of love and life, that which dwells within us and yet transcends our individual experience, the emergent nature of the universe unfolding. We gathered this morning in the midst of deep, terrible tragedy. We gather holding one another in love and in concern. We gather knowing that life can be and is often difficult and challenging. We gather in the hope of transformation we gather in the truth and in the belief that the difficulties that are presented in our lives can give us opportunities to find connection. We gather steadfast and firm that things don't happen to us so that we can grow, but knowing that when things happen to us, we can dig deep within. We can find ourselves surrounded by love that love is a part of the very fabric of this universe and how we are made, how we are drawn together. That love that we can find amongst our family and our friends, but most assuredly within this congregation. We are here as vehicles of that love, the love that ordered the stars, that holds the universe in harmony. We can be that for each other. We are called to be that for each other. So let us be moved and inspired to find ways to love deeper 
and harder and more thoroughly and more tenderly. Let's hold each other in that compassion. May it be so. Amen. And blessed be. Ask what you can do. Ask not what your church can do for you. This is, of course, a paraphrase of a line from John F. Kennedy's inaugural address. JFK was appealing for people to serve this country and this world when he spoke his version of these words, not church. Yet the words apply. We are often asked to serve country, church, and community. I am not someone who jumps at these opportunities. Having said that, however, I have ended up doing a lot of things at BUC, like being a worship associate. I am going to confess, when the Reverend Dr. Kathy Hurt asked me to be a worship associate seven years ago, I wasn't sure I wanted to do it. What happened, and maybe this was someone's strategy, was that a few days later, someone else asked me to do something I knew I didn't want to do. I thought to myself, I'll say yes to being a worship associate, and that will give me a good reason to turn down the other opportunity. But being a worship associate turned out to be something that led to the greatest spiritual growth I've ever known. I did not know it was going to turn out that way, of course. Early in my tenure as a worship associate, the Reverends Kathy Hurt and Penny Hackett Evans offered a class in sermon writing. I had no intention of ever writing a sermon, but thought, as a worship associate, I should sign up. The first assignment was to write something anything. I thought to myself about the mem memoir I had composed in my head during miles and miles of solitary runs. I started writing those memories on paper. Over several weeks, I almost managed to turn it into a sermon, which I read to the sermon writing class, and that was it. I was done with it. A month or two after the class ended, 
I was the worship associate for perhaps the second or third time, but was writing my first reflection. After the service, someone who had been in the sermon writing class with me grabbed me and said, it was great to see what you did with your sermon from the class. It wasn't until that moment I realized the two were even related. Something I did to avoid something else turned out to be one of the best experiences of my life. Many things have come from it, spiritual growth, reevaluation of my beliefs, many written reflections, and maybe even a sermon. Ask what you can do for your church, and you may find what your church can do for you. Oh man, asking somebody to do something you know they don't want to do so they'll do the thing you want them. That's like next level holy evil genius. <laughs> Just take that up. Uh, today's second reading is an excerpt from Unlocking the Power of Covenant. This was the most recent report from the UUA Commission on Appraisal. It came out in June of 2021. Highly recommend everybody read it. There are um, regular appraisals of our association, and this most recent subject was on covenant. Who's using them? How are they using them? Unitarian Universalists do not have a creed or set doctrine, yet we hold as fundamental our promise to conduct a free and responsible search for truth and meaning in our own lives while respecting the search which each other person makes. We also hold the democratic process as fundamental theological precept. The use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large is a central part of what we affirm in covenant with one another. Democratic process is one governed by the will of the majority arising from the free expression of the individual, all of whom respect the outcome. What we see laid out here is the micro and macro imbalance, the individual and community, freedom and responsibility, individual promise and community accountability. Being part of a religious community is a personal commitment that reflects that Unitarian Universalist theological vision, namely that we are part of an interdependent web of all existence. We see the nature of existence as fundamentally interdependent or covenantal. Being in community then is not incidental to being a Unitarian Universalist, but intrinsic and inescapable. It begins with accepting responsibility for and promoting our central mission, the shared ministry of the religious community in service of the world. A religious community needs both mission, its reason for being, its purpose, and covenant, its agreement about the commitment to one another. The song today is a hymn that I wrote in the last year of the pandemic, finished it last week, and Steve has arranged it today. together, worshiping at the same flame, wondering, wondering, questioning, arguing the worth of our lives today. Courage eludes us, our edges file down, an abundance of caution
just one voice in the choir Nothing is what it seems Layers form in between the fears Of walking through the fire We are together We hold one another Our bonds remain through the strife Empathy, sympathy Lovingly walk with me today This is our life So today we are wrapping up our month of worship services, exploring our fifth UU principle, the right to conscience and the use of the Democratic Party. Nope. <laughs> Whoa, paging Dr. Freud. Don't tell anybody I said that. The use of the democratic process <laughs> in our congregation and society at large. Y'all please don't send me hate mail. I know we're not all Democrats. <laughs> we are individuals and we are a group. We are individuals within the context of a group. We each have our own beliefs and perspectives. And the gathering of those individual beliefs and perspectives are what constitutes our congregation. When we engage the democratic process to make decisions that impact all of us, we do so by casting individual votes following our right to conscience. The two are balanced. Democratic process existed in our churches long before the principles were adopted. The system of church governance is called congregational polity. Polity is how churches run, uh, how churches make decisions. And it was the Puritans, our spiritual forebears, who devised the system of congregational polity. And they did that after coming to this continent well over 100 years before this nation became a laboratory for democracy. Congregational polity was actually first articulated in the Cambridge Platform of 1648. Turns out the Cambridge Platform is not a subway station where you wait to take the tea to get to Cambridge. Thank you, Bill. Cambridge Platform was a formal agreement, <laughs> agreement between those old Puritan churches in New England. They were called the Standing Order Churches in those days. There were not enough people or resources for the Puritans to create separate churches for their separate beliefs. So the churches that were gathered were places of religious diversity. The only way to sustain those churches was for people who did not agree to work together. And they gathered out of mutual consent, not mutual belief. And rather than establish a system of centralized authority, such as a bishop or a presbytery, each church recognized no earthly authority outside of its own voting members. And over the time the churches did become aggrieved, they stopped getting along. There was a local flavor that developed in each congregation and that caused strife. The conflict was often about clergy 
who would share responsibilities between churches. And when a liberal minister of a liberal church preached at a conservative church or vice versa, people got really upset. Also, the standards for membership were starting to change between those churches. Statements of faith, proclamations of faith started to be a little different between the churches and that caused big issues when people moved or they needed a resource in a different area. The Cambridge platform created a set of agreements that affirmed both the independence and the interdependence of those standing order churches. It is a covenant that laid a framework for those churches to continue to grow along their own path, determined by the voting of their members, as well as continue to share resources. They affirmed the churches were increasingly different, but they also continued to consent to a mutual relationship. Congregational polity has survived all these long years, even as the standing order churches splintered off over the centuries, our theology has changed immensely. The process has been guided and supported by a commitment to the democratic process and to staying in relationship even when challenged by those differences. A prime example is how the standing order churches voted and some of them became Unitarian. Even when they went their separate ways, which is the Dedham decision, that's a different sermon, but when they went their separate ways, the Cambridge platform held those standing order churches or former standing order churches, now newly Unitarian churches, they were still held in covenantal relationships, despite determining that they were very, very different. They may have hated each other, but they still agreed to work together. And now 50, 150 years or so later, they, those churches might be friends again. <laughs> Not all of them. <laughs> But joking aside, the relationships between the old churches that were once standing order churches and became Unitarian, the ones that didn't become Unitarian, those relationships, they're, they're complicated to this day. Um, and it's true that relationship between any churches that split are, are complicated, including the history of our own church and the church that split off from us. The Cambridge platform gave guidance during those painful splits of the, the 19th century and they may have been furious with each other, but they didn't completely cut off those relationships. In fact, current ministers of the traditions descended from the standing order churches, the Unitarians, the American Baptists, and the United Church of Christ. Ministers from those traditions, including this minister, still honor the Cambridge platform by sharing responsibilities in each other's churches, even across denominational lines sometimes. When the Cambridge platform was written in 1648, it was a necessary act of survival. There were still not enough lay people or clergy to establish completely autonomous churches based on theological differences. Churches only began to break off and to separate and claim separate theologies after they had enough resources to do that. It's amazing what people can do when they don't have any choices. In those earliest of days, people went to church with people that they did not agree with, even people that they maybe thought were going to hell, but they managed to make one church together because they had to. Modern Unitarian Universalists enjoy an astounding amount of freedom and choice and yet we maintain that centuries old tradition of staying together still in mutual consent rather than mutual belief. We don't think that anybody's going to hell anymore, but we are still here despite disagreeing with each other sometimes. What was once necessary for survival has become in fact one of our most cherished traditions and kind of defines us. We have gone from tolerating theological diversity because we have to, to celebrating it. The current shape and texture of modern Unitarian Universalism has come into being through the democratic process. We are here today because of the democratic process or, or where you are because of the democratic process. It was through voting that those Unitarian churches separated from the standing order churches in the 19th century. 
It was voting that led to the merger of the Unitarians and the Universalists in 1961. It was voting that led to the formation of Birmingham Unitarian Church in 1948. Since that time, every major decision of our congregation has been made through a vote, or it should have been. The voting process in our church hasn't always gone the way that it was supposed to. It hasn't been easy or simple. And I know that there have been times where it's been very messy and painful. Some of the stories that I've heard most often, especially in my first year here, have been about the times that the congregation voted for one thing, but then something else happened and how hard that was. Heartbreaking. A breakdown of the democratic process in church can be very damaging. Church is a place where we should be able to believe that things are as they appear. And when they're not, we become bitter and disillusioned. Some of the most difficult moments in the history of this congregation can be tied to a breakdown in the democratic process, or in some cases, perhaps what appeared to be a breakdown, but was actually an issue of poor communication. I'm going to be generous and, and extend that in some cases. The effects have been the same either way. Heartache, confusion, suspicion, reduced faith in the integrity of voting in our congregation, reduced faith in each other, a sense of it doesn't matter if I vote, it doesn't matter if I come to the meeting, it's just going to go the way it's going to go regardless of the vote. People have literally said that to me. And I would like to think that any previous issues of congregational voting integrity are behind us, but I know that those wounds don't heal easily. So if anybody still has pain and heartache, wounds and doubts that need to heal, I ask you, please, come talk to me. That's a pastoral issue. I ask you, please, talk to our board of trustees about the process. Both of those are important, the way we feel and then the way we do it in the future. Speak up. Let your voice be heard. We need to be able to have trust in each other and in this process to move forward together. If there are doubts in anyone's mind in a church about the integrity of, of a voting process, it seriously undermines that everything the church is trying to do, we're trying to do a lot. So let's fix that. You churches are built on and by the democratic process and any rupture in that process poses a threat to the life of the congregation. When there's a lack of trust in the democratic process, you, you churches suffer. When it is unclear who gets to vote and when and why and how, you, you churches suffer. When people just don't show up or don't actually become members, you, you churches suffer. Our entire enterprise, the entire Unitarian Universalist project is built on the idea that churches make decisions for themselves. We make our church through the process of debate and voting. In order for that to work, people have to vote. In order to vote, people have to have faith in and understand the voting process. In our church, people can vote if they meet the following criteria. They have signed the membership book. They have participated in the current fiscal year's pledge campaign by either pledging or requesting a financial hardship waiver. And third, they have to have done both of those things 90 days in advance of the vote. That's from Article 4 of BUC's Constitution. You can find the Constitution on our website so that you yourself can read the whole thing. The annual cycle of our pledge campaign is um, in our year. Our fiscal year can be a little confusing. I think that that muddies the water. I think sometimes that that plays into people feeling frustrated and therefore not voting. So to clarify, the pledge campaign begins the first week of March, and that funds the fiscal year, which starts on July 1st. So here are some real-time examples. First, 
The board has called a special congregational meeting on March 13th that will address some issues in the Constitution that create confusing, challenging timelines for the board structure. It's a governance issue, so I haven't been too, too involved in it. I think it's better for the information to come from the board, not from me. Uh, but I can tell you that in order to vote in that meeting, the deadline to sign the membership book and to either pledge or request a financial wa waiver that was on December 13th of 2021. Secondly, our congregational meeting, our annual meeting is coming up on May 22nd. One of the things that we'll vote on on that day is the eighth principle. That is the newly proposed principle that affirms Unitarian Universalism as actively anti-racist and anti-oppressive. This is one of those issues that actually really affects you know, what is our congregation doing that shapes our congregation and people's voices need to be heard. In order to vote in that meeting, the deadline to sign the membership book and to make a pledge or ask for a waiver uh, was this past Monday, February 21st. Our constitution is very clear about the requirements for voting. Sign the book, pledge campaign, 90 days in advance. Sometimes I hear complaints about how voting is tied to money in our church. A couple things, it's not just our church, it's, it's at least every church I've worked in, which is eight churches, and they're not all Unitarian Universalists, pretty common practice. And two, the Constitution clarifies that voting is contingent upon participating in the pledge drive through pledging or requesting a financial waiver. It's not really about the money, there is no barrier to receiving a waiver, no maximum number of waivers that you can, you can be given. There's no need to explain or justify or make some you know, statement of, I promise I will pledge in the future. You just have to let me know. It can be an email, it could be a phone call. It's totally confidential. And it should be stated that there is no minimum pledge amount, $5, a dollar. The annual pledge campaign, yeah, is about money. That is about funding our beloved community, our vision for ministry, what we wanna do. But it's also about your relationship to the congregation. The pledge campaign is an annual check-in for you to say, yeah, I'm still here and I wanna be a part of things. The constitutional requirement that voters participate in the pledge campaign is a tool of togetherness. Yes, I'm still here. It is also a great equalizer. Everyone gets one vote. It doesn't matter if you pledge $25,000 or you have a financial waiver, that is one vote regardless. Our congregation uses the democratic process. It's not a plutarchy or an oligarchy. It's not the people with the money or the people with the power who make the decisions. It's everybody who has said, yes, I wanna be here and participated in that pledge campaign. Again, that doesn't require money. We make our decisions together, all of us. This is how we shape our congregation and make the institution a reflection of the people within it. We do not get to be the most relevant, cutting edge church of the 21st century by being the very best church of the 1950s. We vote, we take new directions, we take action. And if there isn't a broad base of participation, the congregational po uh, polity process has been cut short, short-circuited even. The entire church suffers. When that happens, congregations become insular, in-group, out-group dynamics take over, worship, programming becomes stagnant, and growth becomes practically impossible because it's a frustration for newer people to not understand how things work when we say that things go one way and then they go another or when we continue to do things in the same exact way and we don't include newer people newer voices newer ideas and how we do things it is brutal when that happens to churches and i do not want that to happen to us we have too much to do we need to hear everyone's voices. The democratic process means 
specifically, that we do not have to agree. <laughs> it's not consensus, it's democracy, which means we vote and sometimes the answer is no. We should not always agree. Respectful disagreements and productive conflict are necessary for the health of our congregation for any church. The hope of the democratic process is robust debate that produces the best result, not the lowest common denominator found through avoiding conflict or continuing to do things always in the same way that happens by avoiding conflict. We don't need that. I'm gonna quote the Hebrew scriptures here, and I did this in my newsletter article, and I think it's important to say it, so I'm gonna say it again. Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron, and one person sharpens the wits of another. Debate healthy, respectful debate. It's okay to disagree. It's more than possible for us to do so with love. The right to conscience, the use of the democratic process. The real danger for any UU congregation is not conflict. It is lack of participation in the name of keeping the peace. Congregational polity, giving the congregation the authority to make its own decisions is foundational to Unitarian Universalism. It's how we came into existence from the get, from those early days of the Standing Order Puritan churches to people voting and saying, mm, God is not three, God is one, and becoming Unitarians, to today. All of that rooted in the democratic process. It is so important that we included it in our association-wide covenant, which by the way, the principles are part of the bylaws of the Unitarian Universalist Association. It's Article 2 of the bylaws of the UUA. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, do covenant and affirm the right to conscience and the use of the democratic process in our congregations and in society at large. So when we say, ask not what your church can do for you, there is so much that our church can do for you. But there are things that we need to do, all of us, for our church. Showing up and voting is, is one that may seem trivial, but is actually very, very important and foundational. So I, I hope to see you on the 12th of March for the, uh, the ever exciting vote to uh, change the Constitution, to uh, make the voting um, timelines a little different, um, but also in, in May when it comes time for us to vote on the future of our church and our stance on anti-oppression and anti-racist work. May it be so. Amen. now into this world and take with you some of the hope and the joy that you found here. Go in joy, go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins. May it be so. Amen and blessed be.